Recording is active. All right, I've got top of the hour. You ready to go? Ready to go. All right, here we go. The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Welcome, everyone. You are signed on to the Rotronic Instrument Corporation webinar, How to Read a Psychrometric Chart. These webinars are designed to help you make a better measurement of humidity. And the first step to making a better measurement is to understand the parameter that you wish to measure. And that is the underlying intent of this course. We believe understanding the psychrometric chart is a great way to understand all the different humidity parameters. Everyone who registered for the webinar will receive a copy of the slides and a link to the recording. We deliver this two different ways. The first is you'll receive an email within about 24 hours of this live broadcast and it'll have a link to the recording and the slides. And we'll also post it on the Rotronic web, uh, website, rotronic-usa.com. And you can download and the slides and watch the recording at any time at your leisure. Everyone is in listen-only mode. That means you cannot speak to us directly via your phone or your computer microphone. But we do want to hear from you. We'd like to hear the, your interaction. And the way to do that is to type a question or a comment or a suggestion. Just type them into the questions window. If you look at your control panel, you should see a, pane, a panel that says questions. Just open that up and type them in. And as we're going through, we're going to have two different Q&A sessions during the webinar. But as you're listening and watching and going through the exercises, when a question comes to mind, just type it in at any time and we'll queue those up during the Q&A sessions. So we do encourage you to ask questions. And another point, if you have not downloaded your psychrometric chart and printed it out, I encourage you to go ahead and do that. This is an interactive exercise. It'll be the most fun and you'll get the most out of it if you have a chart in front of you with a pencil and a ruler and you just follow along with us. You can download your chart, look at for your control panel, the handouts section, and there's two charts there. There's an IP and an SI units. We'll be using the IP chart. So if you have not downloaded that yet, go ahead and do it, please, and download it and print it out, and uh, I guarantee you it'll be more fun. This webinar is presented and produced by Rotronic Instrument Corporation. If you don't know Rotronic, Rotronic manufactures precision measurement instruments for various parameters, obviously including humidity, and also offers a monitoring system, a universal monitoring system for controlled environments and regulated environments. We don't talk about the instruments or the monitoring system at this webinar because it's educational. We're going to teach you about the psychrometric chart, but if you do want to talk about the products, we'd love to hear from you. Send us an email, give us a phone call, look it up on the website. Delighted to talk about that aspect of the business. Speaking today, my name is Bruce McDuffie. I'm with the Rotronic Marketing Department, but don't hold that against me. <laughs> the, um, I have taught hundreds of humidity measurement webinars and seminars and I was a field salesperson selling humidity measurement in the field for several years. So I've been there, looked at the applications, and done a lot of humidity education. Michael Boatskis is your co-presenter today. Michael is an independent metrologist. He specializes in relative humidity and temperature measurement. He's been involved in manufacturing and calibration of both humidity and temperature for about the past 17 years. Welcome, Michael. 
Thank you, Bruce. It's great to be here with everyone today. Great to have you. So folks, once again, this webinar is being recorded and everyone will get a copy of the recording and a link to and a copy of the slides via email within about 24 hours and on the Rotronic website. So before we get started, we have a couple of questions for the audience. It's always interesting to understand who else is out there. So I have a poll here I will launch. First question is, what is your industry? Let's go ahead and click on your industry. And let's see who's out there. Already a lot of other out there. So um, folks, if you do, if you don't mind, just go ahead and type in the question pane, what industry you're in, if it's not on the list. Always makes it a little more interesting. There's a lot. Other is winning, Michael. <laughs> that that's happened a couple times now. Yeah, yeah, it is. We got we semi. Add some more things into this. Yeah, we got automotive testing, industrial minerals, semiconductor, automotive, OEM rail car, HVAC. There's an interesting one. Retail supermarkets, education. Wow! Thanks everyone for sharing that. And this. We'll leave the poll open for a few more seconds here. I'm going to go ahead and close it. But you can keep typing in your industries in the chat in the question pane. We'll share the results. And there you have it. HVAC is well represented as well. Some pharma folks out there, a few heavy manufacturing, no food folks today. Okay, we won't talk food applications. <laughs> All right, thanks for doing that, folks. And I have one other poll before we get into the presentation, and that is, why do you want to learn about the psychrometric chart? Because it's just fun, that's why we're here. <laughs> You've always wanted to learn how to read one, but never really had the chance. Helps you understand humidity measurement, use it in your profession on a regular basis, and then a few other reasons. Good. Helps to understand humidity measurement. And again, that is the that is the real premise of these webinars, because humidity is a tough measurement. Most of us would agree on that. It's not like mass or distance. Those are easy. I'll leave it open for a few more seconds here. Hope people get their votes in. I'm going to go ahead and close it here now and share the results. Good. Some good good mix there, Michael. Yeah. A few that think it's just plain fun, so that's good to see. Yeah. Like I said, that's why I'm here. I know. <laughs> and with that, I'm going to turn it over to Michael to talk about what we'll cover today. Michael. Thanks, Bruce. Let's hide the results here. So our agenda okay. today, we're, we're going to look at what the psychrometric chart is. Why is it important to you? So how would how would you end up using this during your, your work life or potentially at home? What information is on the chart? So what is the anatomy of the chart? What information can we get out of that? Once we've gone through those areas, we're going to go through three exercises to give you some demonstrations of using the chart. We'll look at a wet bulb, dry bulb measurement and how from those two values that we might get from a sling psychrometer, how we could get the rest of our humidity parameters. We'll go through an example using a controlled environment warehouse, uh, some things that we might want to look at there. And then we'll go through a third example with evaporative cooling. So the key takeaways that we're looking for today is to give everyone a, a visual representation that can help you better understand relative humidity and the impact that different parameters such as temperature may have on your relative humidity values. We'll also give you a, hopefully give you a little bit of an idea of where using the psychrometric chart might be a little bit easier or faster than using an app that we, that we would have on our smartphone or our computer. Uh, just as a, a quick tool to give us some 
some quick and fast answers uh, for what we might be looking for. After that, I will pass it back to Bruce. I think we've got uh, one more one more quick poll for everybody. Oh, won't show you the, the secrets yet. Right. Thank you. Before we go into the uh, description of the chart, we do have another poll. And this one is... What is your level of knowledge? What is your level of knowledge around the psychrometric chart? And this helps us gauge it a little bit for our presentation. It's also good to know, are you an expert, a novice? This is your first exposure to the chart. You know enough to get the job done. Which one most closely resembles your experience? Give it a few more seconds here. Looks like most folks, a lot of most folks novice today, Michael. Yeah, a few first exposures as well. Yeah. It's great to see. One or two experts out there. Good to hear too. I'll go ahead and close the poll and show everyone the results. Did I not show them? See if that works. There it is. Okay, thanks for sharing that information, folks. We do have a couple of quizzes sprinkled out throughout the, the webinar. So uh, just so you know, those are coming. Okay, with that, let's get into it. What is a psychrometric chart? A psychrometric chart, it's really just a visual representation of the various humidity parameters. I've seen a couple of statistics that explain why we like the visual representation so much. One is that 50% of us are visual learners. In other words, we learn best by observing things with our sight. Another interesting statistic is that the brain processes visual images 60,000 times faster than text. So that's the, some of the value of the psychrometric chart. A little history about it. The psychrometric chart, as we're looking at it here today, was invented by Willis Carrier back in 1904. But one thing, a little known, less known fact, is that about the same time, 1904, there was a man named Richard Molier, and he actually invented the same type of chart, just in a different format, as you can see on the right-hand side there. And he called his the enthalpy entropy chart, and it really plots the same information just in a different orientation. So there's some history for you on the psychrometric chart and what it is in a nutshell. And with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Michael for why we care, why we bother, Michael. So now that we've got apps and, and other things readily available to us that can do these calculations for us, why do we still care very much about being able to read the psychrometric chart. Well, for us, one of the key things is the ability to get some visualization of what's going on in, in our environment and the different parameters that can affect our measurements. So we can see from the chart, if we change the temperature of the air a little bit, what does that do to our relative humidity readings? Or does that affect things like our dew point or frost point measurements? So by using the chart, we're able to get an, a better understanding of what's going on in the environment and how different changes will affect our, our readings. So this helps us get a better understanding of relative humidity and the different interactions so that we can better anticipate problems that potentially are going to show up in our environments. Uh, it can also be very useful if we're trying to do quick conversions in the field or get an idea of what's going to happen again, as we change different parameters. Uh, Bruce, we've got a chart here. I see lots of lines, lots of curves. Can you go through and help us uh, determine what these are? Absolutely. And it does look complex, especially if it's your first view of the psychrometric chart. As Michael said, a lot of lines, lots some curves. But it's not really that complex when you dissect it piece by piece, which is what we will do now. 
Once again, if you have not downloaded your own chart, printed it out, have your ruler and your pencil ready, I encourage you to do that. And for those folks who came on a few minutes after we started, you can download your chart still right now. If you look in your control panel, just look for the handouts section and open that up and download the IP chart. That's what we'll be working with. Print it out and as I mentioned, you'll have more fun and learn more if you follow along with us. So if you have your chart out, the first thing we're going to look at is the dry bulb. And the dry bulb, get a spotlight here, bottom of the chart. In this particular chart, it starts at 20 degrees Fahrenheit, goes up to 120 degrees Fahrenheit. And then the temperature lines are vertical lines that extend throughout vertically through the chart. And that's our first part of the chart to look at. The next part will be the humidity ratio. And humidity ratio, the units are grains per pound of dry air. And this is a mass per mass unit. If we recall from our humidity theory webinar, humidity ratio is sometimes also called mixing ratio. And it is an absolute measure of the amount of moisture or water vapor present in the air. So that's the right hand side over here. These are horizontal lines that go throughout the chart. The next one we'll look at is the saturation curve. And this is an important property that everybody should be aware of. On the saturation curve, we're at 100% relative humidity. And some interesting things occur here on the saturation curve. And that is that the dew point will equal your dry bulb temperature. Your wet bulb temperature will equal your dew point, will equal your dry bulb. And your partial pressure or vapor pressure will equal your saturation vapor pressure. Those are a lot of terms to throw out there. Right now, if you're wanting to learn more about the terms, check out one of our past webinars on relative humidity and dew point or basic humidity theory. You can watch those on demand at the website. Just go to rotronic-usa.com slash academy. So that's the saturation curve. The next one we'll look at are the relative humidity line or curves. These are the curved lines throughout the chart. Those are relative humidity, which are expressed in a percent. If we recall our theory again, relative humidity is the percent or it's the amount of water vapor present divided by the total possible amount that could be present based on the temperature. We can see the numbers here on the chart from 10% to 90% and then of course 100% on the saturation curve. One thing to note, these are not linear. They are curved and they change as temperature increases. The next part of the chart will be the dew point. And if I'm, if I'm going too fast, um, just go ahead and type in the question pane. Slow down, Bruce, and I'll take it a little slower. We've got a lot to cover, so I'm trying to keep it at a good pace. But, or if you have a question that, that crops up immediately, go ahead and type it in. And uh, I don't want to go too fast for everybody. OK, this portion of the chart is the dew point. We remember that dew point, everyone think back in your minds, the definition, it's the temperature at which water vapor will begin to condense. And this is degrees Fahrenheit on this chart from about minus 20 to about 90. And these are horizontal lines that go across the chart. Okay, and the next section to look at is the vapor pressure, or this is also sometimes called the partial pressure of water vapor. And this section is in inches of mercury. And again, vapor pressure is also an absolute amount measurement of the amount of water vapor present. It doesn't change with pressure or, or it doesn't change with temperature. 
inches of mercury in this chart from about a little less than 0.1 to about 1.33 and a half. And a note is that these are all represented by horizontal lines. So they're all parallel. The humidity ratio, the dew point, and the vapor pressure are parallel lines. Okay, the next section is going to be the enthalpy. Enthalpy is a measurement of energy that's present in a in a um, environment and enthalpy it looks like a lot highlighted here but really all it is the enthalpy lines are diagonal lines and you can see here you can pick off the enthalpy lines up here on this upper scale or on the right hand scale or on the bottom scale that's why those are all highlighted there are not enthalpy numbers internally here on the chart. Enthalpy, as I mentioned, it's an energy measurement and it's expressed in BTU per pound of dry air on this chart. That's the IP unit. And finally, oh not finally, we have two more. Wet bulb temperature. Wet bulb temperature is the temperature of the air as water evaporates. And these are expressed in diagonal lines, almost parallel to enthalpy, but not quite exactly parallel. If we look at like the 30 BTU per pound measurement, you can see it's right, starts out on the same line as the 65 degree wet bulb, but it diverges here as the temperature increases. So wet bulb, you can see the numbers here. There's 80, there's 75, 70, 65, and so on, all the way down to 20 degrees. Wet bulb temperature, it's the temperature of the air. Somebody just asked a quick question. So it's a temperature of the air as water evaporates. And we have an entire exercise on wet bulb, dry bulb here later on. But that's essentially the definition. And the last one we'll show is the specific volume. And specific volume is kind of hard to see because they're very faint lines. But you can see, here's the one I highlighted. It's a volume per mass measurement. So it's the really the inverse of density. We've got a line here, 14.5. We've got a line here, 15 and you can see them throughout the chart. And that, folks, is the anatomy of the psychrometric chart. Not so bad once you can dissect it and really focus in on it. And with that, I think we have a quiz. We do. See if everyone was paying attention here. Give me one second here. Okay. The quiz, which one, and this choose you can choose more than one here if you like. Give it a second to show up. There it is. Which of the following are represented by diagonal lines on the chart? Go ahead and think about that for a second. You can even reference your psychrometric chart that you printed out. <laughs> Should be pretty straightforward, right, Michael? Hopefully. Give it a few seconds. The diagonal lines. Diagonal straight lines, I should say. Give it a few seconds here. The answers are coming in fast and furious. Okay, let's go ahead and shut down the polling and I'll share the results. Last chance. Three, two, one. Closed. And the correct answer is that the enthalpy lines and the wet bulb lines are the only diagonal lines. Relative humidity, recall, was the curved lines. Dew point was a horizontal, perfectly horizontal line. 
and saturation was the relative humidity curve at 100%. So enthalpy and wet bulb are your diagonal lines from this selection. Actually, we could have also included specific volume, which is a diagonal line. Okay, thanks everyone. Hope that was useful and helpful. And with that, I am going to turn it back over to Michael for the wet bulb, dry bulb exercise. Michael? Thank you, Bruce. Put that slide away. Great. So, for this first exercise, we're going to look at the measurements that we would get from a sling psychrometer and look to see how we could potentially convert those into all the other humidity values that we might want. So for those of you not familiar, we've got a, a picture of a sling psychrometer here. Um, these still get used in, in some applications. It's a relatively inexpensive way of measuring relative humidity. Uh, so they're, they're using handheld models like this. Uh, there's also some environmental chambers that, that can use this type of measurement to, to control the, the environment in them. So what they essentially are is two thermometers. The, the first thermometer here is just a measure of the, the, uh, sorry, the, the dry bulb temperature. And so all that is is the ambient temperature of our environment. The second temperature probe, uh, which is just above here, has the, has the white sock on it. And there would be water placed onto this sock and that would, uh, as that water evaporates, the energy that it takes to evaporate that water comes out of the air and is actually bringing down the temperature of this thermometer. So you actually get a lower temperature, and that is your wet bulb temperature. So as the water evaporates, you get a cooling effect uh, leading to a lower temperature. Uh, so for this example, we've got a, we're going to assume a dry bulb temperature of 80 Fahrenheit and we've got a wet bulb temperature of 65. And our task then is to determine what the other parameters are. So hopefully you've got your psychrometric charts out and you can, you can work along with this. Uh, so the first thing we want to do is find our, our data point on the chart. So we want to find where our dry bulb temperature and our wet bulb temperature would intersect on the chart. So for starters, we would go find our dry bulb temperature of 80 Fahrenheit uh, along the x-axis here, and then move up that line until we get to our wet bulb temperature of about 65. And hopefully, you came up with a point roughly the same spot as here. Uh, but that, so that's the first thing we need to do. We need to find out, okay, where is our data point? One of the more common pieces of information we would want to find out from here is our relative humidity. Um, so for this, what we would be doing, and again, do this on your chart, is we would want to look at our relative humidity lines, which again are the curved lines here. So we can see in this case, our point is right between our 40 and 50 percent relative humidity curves. So based on that, we know our relative humidity, it's about 45%. Another piece of information that we would want to find would be our dew point. Uh, and on the same axis as this, we're also going to be able to see things like our vapor pressure and humidity ratio. So let, let's look for all of those now at the same time. Those values, we know they're all over here on our y-axis. So in order to get them, all we need to do is look over to the y-axis. And through the magic of the internet, I get to cheat a little bit here. Well, there we go. Uh, so if we just go over on our line to, the, to this other axis, we can see and find our dew point, our vapor pressure, and our humidity ratios. And so just by looking at the scale, we can see that our dew point is about 56.5 Fahrenheit. We've got a vapor pressure of 0.47 inches of mercury. And our humidity ratio here, uh, 69 grains of moisture per pound of dry air. So again, all of these, 
we've gotten just from knowing the intersecting point of our dry bulb and wet bulb. Going on and looking at our enthalpy, which is another value we can get here. We just change this over to the enthalpy line. We can see that the enthalpy line intersects our point at about 30 BTU per pound. So from just these two values, we're able to get all the other humidity values. And really this, this holds true for any two intersecting points on this chart. Once we know a specific point based on two, two particular values, we can go out and calculate any of our other humidity parameters. Another piece of information that we might want to be able to find from this chart that takes a little bit more work to get would be our saturation vapor pressure. For those of you that remember uh, saturation vapor pressure, it is only defined by, by the temperature of the air. So it's only, the value that's only important there is our dry bulb temperature. Um, in order to get this, what we would be doing is we need to figure out for this dry bulb temperature, what is, or where would we find the, the saturation of the air? And to do that, what we want to do is find the saturation, uh, saturation curve here. So just going up the 80 degree line, we just want to follow that all the way up until we get to our saturation curve. Once we've done that, we can go over to the y-axis and determine what the partial pressure of water would be for this to be on this saturation curve. And based on this, we're able to see that it's about 1.02 inches of mercury. So hopefully you're able to follow that and, and see that based on just this one data point, so based on the intersection of our dry bulb and our wet bulb values, we're able to go through and see, find out all these other parameters that relate to that. As well, we can see, you know, if we, if we increase the temperature a little bit or decrease it a little bit, we can very easily see the impact that it would have on things like relative humidity. So that concludes this part. And Bruce, I believe we've got a, another quiz for everybody. We do. We have a quiz and then we'll have some uh, Q&A session. So as we um, queue up the quiz here, if you have some questions about these first two sections, whether it's the anatomy of the chart or plotting and getting uh, results or other conversions from the chart, go ahead and type them in. So this quiz is true or false. It's not showing up yet. Why won't you show up? There we go. There it is. True or false, we can determine all of the parameters from a state point at the intersection of dew point and humidity ratio. So all you need to do is find and remember where we got dew point and where we got humidity ratio and is there an intersection point where we can get all of the other parameters. Give it a few seconds. I guess it's a little bit of a tricky question. What do you think, Michael? <laughs> it's a little bit of a trick question. You, you've got to ask yourself, uh, do dew point and humidity ratio uh, intersect with each other? So there's the hint. To look at on the chart. There's the hint. All right, we'll give it a few more seconds. Looks like some folks are changing their answer out there, which is, that's okay. I'm going to go ahead and close it out. Last chance. Three, two, one. And I'll share the results. And the answer is false because the dew point and humidity ratio are parallel lines, or actually the same line. So they do not intersect. They go to infinity and never intersect because they're the same line. I guess somebody could argue that's an intersection, but for the <laughs> for the purpose of this that the lines have to cross, they have to intersect. So if you have relative humidity and dew point, if you have wet bulb and relative humidity, if you have temperature and vapor pressure, any of those ones that intersect, as the exercise Michael just went through, you can get all of the parameters. Okay. Good job, everyone. Hide the poll. 
and let's go ahead and take some questions. Here's a question was, can you repeat the definition of wet bulb? I did cover that during the chart exercise, but essentially it's the temperature at which um, air is at as water evaporates, because when water evaporates, it, it needs energy. And when it takes the energy from the air to evaporate or change the state, the temperature cools down. And I said, yeah, you said that the saturation curve equals 100% RH. Yeah, what I said was on the saturation curve, you're at 100% relative humidity. And I also said that the dry bulb temperature will be equal to the wet bulb temperature. And I also said that the dry bulb will be equal to the dew point. And actually those three are all the same. Dew point, wet bulb, and dry bulb will be the same temperature on the saturation curve. Here's one for you, Michael. What is the difference between relative humidity and humidity ratio? Okay, that's a good question. So relative humidity is, is just a ratio of how much water is in the air as compared to how much water the air can hold. So uh, the amount of water vapor that the air can hold will vary as, as temperature changes. So this, as the name suggests, is a, is a relative uh, measurement. Uh, as temperature changes, if you don't change the amount of water in the air, the relative humidity would change. So it's always a ratio of how much water is there to how much the air can hold. The, the humidity ratio is an absolute measurement of the, of the water content in the air. So it, it doesn't matter what temperature the air is at, it doesn't matter what pressure the air is at, it, it's actually a, a measurement of, it, it's done in, uh, it's done in in mass per mass, so it, it's the amount of mass of water vapor compared compared to the amount of mass of air that's present there. Uh, but it, it's then an absolute measurement. Uh, you can change the temperature; it's not going to change the mass of the water vapor in the air. So that that's the difference between them. One is absolute, and and the other one uh, will change as some of the other parameters change. Okay. Good description, thank you. And here's a question. At what temperature change will water do or will water condense? What do you think about that one, Michael? What are we getting at there? Well, when you've got water condensing, uh, you, you mentioned the, the word dew. That is when, we, we commonly refer to that as dew. When we wake up in the morning and the grass is wet, uh, we're looking at quite often dew or condensation. So what that is, the temperature at which water will condense out of the air, that's our dew point temperature. A um, little add-on to that, if you're below freezing, you may be looking at your frost point temperature uh, because actually you, it condenses in the form of frost rather than dew. Um, that explanation is a little bit simplified. Uh, one, some of our other presentations on dew point go into that uh, a little bit more in more detail but essentially that's the dew point temperature we're looking at okay thanks I think we need to move on to our next presentation and a bunch of questions coming in thanks everyone for sending them in keep them coming if we run out of time and we don't get a chance to answer your questions we'll be sure to get back to you via email and we have another Q&A session coming up here too so we'll get as many as we can Okay, the next section is about a controlled environment, and this is a practical exercise. Here's the situation. We've got a warehouse, and the ideal conditions inside of this warehouse are 40% relative humidity and 80 degrees Fahrenheit. So it's a newly built warehouse, let's say. The condition we want to look at, the outdoor condition, is where the air is at 40 degrees Fahrenheit and 60% RH. And so your boss comes to you and says, okay, we need to understand what's happening here um, under these certain outdoor conditions. If, we're, if the outdoor condition is 40 degrees F, 60% RH, will we be okay on the inside if we heat that air to 80 degrees? Will we have to humidify, dehumidify, or will we be okay? 
you have to answer that question for your boss. And then the second question he asks is, will we be getting condensation on the windows under these same conditions? So let's go ahead and take our psychrometric charts out and answer the first question. Will we have to humidify or dehumidify uh, or will everything be fine as is? So what we have, what we know is that we know that the outside air is 40 degrees F, 60% RH. We know that we're going to be taking outside air in, heating it with some type of a uh, HVAC device and exhausting it into the inside, air inside warehouse where we want it to be 80 degrees F and 40% RH. So the first thing we want to do is plot that first point. So if we plot the point here, um, here's your first point right here. We find the temperature value, 40 degrees. We find the RH value, 60% and we plot our state point. That's the outside air. Now, as we bring that air and heat it, we're not adding moisture, we're not removing moisture, so we can follow this line directly across horizontally to the new temperature right here at 80 degrees. So we can see immediately that our relative humidity has gone from 60% down to about 15%. We look about in between the two RH lines. So we know that because we heated that air, the relative humidity decreased. And if you recall from some of our previous theory webinars, that's a rule of thumb. As you increase the temperature, relative humidity goes down. As you decrease the temperature, relative humidity goes up. So your answer would be, yes, we do have to humidify the air in this particular situation. So you might have to install a humidifier. And we can see our state, our ideal point is right here. So we would have to add moisture to get to this point. Okay. Oops. Give me one second here. Now, that's the answer to the first question. And pretty simple, really. We saw how the relative humidity is affected by temperature changes. The next one is a little bit more complex. We want to know if we're going to get condensation on the windows because apparently the security team at this facility is kind of lazy. They don't want to get out of their car and open the door and go inside to see what's going on. They want to be able to look through the windows, see inside that warehouse. So will the, there be condensation? If our indoor condition is 80 degrees F, 40% RH, we're going to assume that the glass temperature is the same as the outdoor temperature because they put in cheap glass. So the temperature along that glass pane is 40 degrees Fahrenheit. If we recall when we want to know if condensation will occur or not, we look at dew point. So we need to find the dew point. And the first thing we do is plot our point, 80 degrees F. 40% RH, one got that. Then to find the dew point, we just follow the horizontal line over to the dew point scale. And we can see that our dew point inside is going to be 53 degrees. And as we recall, any time that the dew point is higher than the temperature, we're going to get condensation. So the answer would be yes, this is, we're going to have condensation on the windows in this condition. So we're going to have to solve for that problem to make sure we don't get condensation without changing the internal environment. Okay, moving along, we have a quiz about that section. And the quiz here is true or false. Relative humidity increases when we heat that cooler air. We just went through this. So I expect 100% on this one. Well, you never actually get a truly 100%.
<laughs> looks like the audience is doing pretty good so far. Yeah, that's good. Are you talking about relative humidity or the quiz? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, either. <laughs> okay. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and close this one out because we are getting a little bit short on time. And I'll share the result. And the correct answer is false. It's the exact opposite. Anytime you increase the temperature of air without changing the moisture content, your relative humidity is going to drop. You're going to get drier conditions. Okay, thanks everyone for indulging us. And this turn it over to Michael for the final exercise about evaporative cooling. Thanks, Bruce. So in this example, we're going to look at evaporative coolers and take a look at two different cities, two different locations, and see whether or not this would be an effective way of, of cooling a room. Uh, we're going to look at the example of New York City, uh, where we've got 90 degree Fahrenheit, 65 percent relative humidity, and then Denver, where it's about 90 degree Fahrenheit, 25 percent relative humidity. So we're looking middle of summer when we're looking to do some cooling. So just as a, just to let everyone know what an evaporative cooler is, if you're not familiar with them and how they work, we've got a diagram of the in interior of them. Uh, what they are essentially is there's a, they've got a water source or a pool of water, which is represented here at the bottom. This water gets pumped up uh, through these tubes and gets put onto these evaporative pads. And the purpose of these pads is essentially to increase the surface area of the water significantly so that as the air goes over it, uh, the air will reach saturation. So as much water as possible will evaporate and we'd get 100% relative humidity air uh, on the output. This evaporation, as we've seen through the, is similar to the sling psychrometer as the water is evaporating that air will cool down because the energy has gone into changing the state of water from a liquid to a gas. So as the air comes across these pads, uh, it, the, the water will evaporate and the, the air will cool down, and then it goes into our, our room. So if we first look at New York City, we've given you a head start here and we, we found our set point uh, we know we're at 90 degrees Fahrenheit. It's about 65% relative humidity. Um, so we want to know how much will that air cool. Uh, so in order to do that, we, we know that air is going to saturation, and we know what the, the wet bulb temperature is, because based on our line here, we're able to see that our wet bulb temperature is about 80 Fahrenheit. So all we have to do is take that up to our saturation curve, and we can see that the temperature of the air, so at the saturation curve, we know that our wet bulb temperature equals our dry bulb temperature. We see that our dry bulb will become about 80 Fahrenheit. So we know we've got about a 10 degrees worth of cooling. So not a particularly large amount of cooling. It is something. Uh, but the other thing we have to remember is that the air coming into our room will now be at 100% relative humidity. So we're, we're going from a 65% a relative humidity in our room, but it's going to increase even farther. So this probably isn't a good application because the it's not going to be comfortable for us to be operating in, in this condition. And this is why we won't see this type of cooler uh, or this, the evaporative coolers on coasts or regions where it's relatively high humidity. If we then go and look at how this would compare to Denver, we end up with, with a different starting point on our, on our psychrometric chart. Again, 90 Fahrenheit for our dry bulb temperature, but our relative humidity being 25%, we end up with a wet bulb temperature that's considerably lower. We can see here that we're at about the, the 65 Fahrenheit wet bulb temperature. So in this example, we can see that we actually end up with about 25 degrees worth of cooling, which is far more effective uh, for cooling down a room. 
And even though we've got 100% air going into the room, since our starting relative humidity was that much lower, it's not going to have a huge impact on the overall comfort of people in that environment. So this is why we will see in many of the drier states, the evaporative coolers are far more common uh, because they, they tend to be very effective and, and very efficient at actually lowering our room temperatures. Um, so I believe we've got one more quiz. Uh, now, Bruce, uh, before we go on to our final question and answer period. Yeah, quick question for the audience. And the question is about evaporative cooling capacity. Evaporative cooling capacity can be determined by, there's only one answer on this, dry bulb, wet bulb, relative humidity, all of the above, which is dry bulb, wet bulb, relative humidity, or just wet bulb. If you recall Michael's presentation, Michael's excellent presentation, had all the answers in there. And then we've got some questions coming in, so keep them coming. Yeah, that's, there's a question from Nathaniel. He says, that's what they call a swamp cooler. Exactly. That's what Michael showed, is a swamp cooler. And I live in Denver, and we have those all over the place out here, and they are very, very efficient at cooling a home, much more efficient than a refrigerant-type cooler. But you'll never see one in New York or San Francisco or Houston because there's just too much moisture in the air. Yeah, swamp cooler, that's the term. Okay, let's go ahead and close out the poll or the quiz. And the correct answer is all of the above. You can determine the cooling capacity by the dry bulb, wet bulb, and relative humidity. I guess really it's a combination of those. Yeah, you can't know it just based on one of those values. You need to know a couple of them in yeah. order to figure it out. Maybe I should refine that one. <laughs> okay, let's go into the Q&A session. Uh, let's see, Michael, we have a lot of good questions here. What, there was a couple of questions about on the, the wet bulb, the psych, sling psychrometer. The, it, I guess we went too fast to show where the sock was on that. But um, rather than go back to that, if um, the, the, it just looked like a white bulb. And to get wet bulb temperature, you have to have a wet sock over a thermometer, and then you have to pass air across it. With a sling, you're slinging it around over your head, hopefully. Sometimes there's little fans. Somehow you've got to move air across that so that the water evaporates, and that's how you get the wet bulb. Here's one for you, Michael. What measurement do I need to figure out supply air temperature on an air handling unit to bring down the relative humidity? Trying to figure out for chilled water temperature. Okay, so in this case, I believe what we're trying to achieve here is to dehumidify the air. Uh, so in order to do that, the, the question I would ask is what relative humidity are we trying to get to? So what water content do we want to, to have in our air? Uh, from that, I would look to see, based on, on the ambient conditions for relative humidity and temperature, what dew point are we looking for? So if we're going to dehumidify the air through a, through a cooling system or a refrigeration system, we need to have that air going over some sort of uh, cooling system that's going to be at or below that the dew point that we're trying to get to. So if we're trying to get to a 30 degree dew point uh, environment, we need to make sure that the cooling system is, is cooled down to 30 degree. And that will take out, uh, that will output water that has a, or air that has a 30 degree dew point value. Um, so it's really the dew point or frost point that you want to determine in that example. Okay, good. Here's a question. How can the humidity ratio be above 100? And I think what that's getting at is if, if it's a mass per mass, how can it be over 100? But 
The reason it's over 100 is because you've got different units. You've got grains divided by pound, and that's why it can be more than 100, because it's a different unit. And sometimes you'll see um, another common measurement from humidity ratio is grams per kilogram. So that's the reason it's not a, per it's not a percentage. Okay. How about this one, Michael? What's the difference between relative humidity and absolute humidity? Uh, another good question. Uh, relative humidity, as we've discussed, is the relative uh, amount of humidity in the air, so the amount of water vapor in the air compared to the amount that that air can hold, so a percent value. When you're looking at absolute humidity, the units for that are, uh, they vary between a couple different ones, but it's an absolute measurement. You're, you're essentially counting the number of molecules in that volume of air, in that space. So that, that value will not change as you change other parameters like temperature or pressure. So that, that's the difference between those two. Thank you. Here's one to test your memory. I think I know the answer to this, but Michael, maybe you do. What is the volume or weight of a grain of moisture? I honestly don't know the conversion to that offhand. Um, I think I'm, I'm used to working in the in the SI unit, so <laughs> yeah, I don't know that conversion. I think it's it's like 0 0.06, I believe, but we'd have to double check that. It's pretty small. Uh, so someone's coming with uh, 7,000 gra grains equals one pound. All right, there we go, folks. Thank you for posting that. Okay. There was a couple of questions on the, the presentation where we talked about moisture on the window in the warehouse, and maybe I went too fast through that. The idea is that if the temperature of the glass is 40 degrees Fahrenheit, that means the air right along that surface of the glass, the air is also at 40 degrees Fahrenheit. So anytime that your dew point of the associated air that's next to that 40 degree air, anytime your dew point is, is at or below the temperature, no, is that right, Michael? I always get this mixed up. At, yeah. So if, if your air temperature is below your dew point temperature, you right. get the condensation. Right, and the air temperature along the glass is below the dew point, which is, was 53. So anytime those two are the same or, or <laughs> whatever what Michael just said, you're going to get condensation. So that's, sorry I wasn't clear on that. Okay. Let's see what else we have here. Got a lot of questions. Can you please explain how to overcome condensation on doors in a medical marijuana facility without affecting the life cycle of the plants? Well, we happen to be experts here in Colorado on marijuana facilities. So <laughs> explain how to overcome condensation on the door. The only way to overcome condensation any place, regardless of the application, is to make sure that the air temperature is well above the dew point temperature. So anytime you have a difference between air temperature and dew point, you're not going to get condensation. So you need to monitor those two parameters. Monitor your dew point of your space and the actual temperature of the door. And as long as you keep those two separate by, you know, five degrees at C or something like that, you'll never get condensation. So it doesn't really matter about what's in the facility. It's about dew point and temperature. Yeah, the, it, it, the solution could be, it's, it's either going to be to heat the door to bring it above the dew point, or else uh, potentially you need to reduce the, the amount of water content in the air. Uh, I don't know how that will affect the, the plant growth, um, but it would be, have some sort of dehumidification in the room uh, to reduce the overall humidity. Exactly. It's like we're about out of time, folks. Uh, thanks for all those great questions. And as I said, we will get back to you uh, with answers via email and great comments, too. I love the interaction on this webinar. It was really, really fun. So just to summarize before we sign off, we talked about what is the psychrometric chart. 
It's a visual representation. Why bother? Because it's visual. It's quick, it's easy, it's very simple. When it comes to, you don't have to have a power, like for an app on your phone, if your phone runs out of battery and you're out in the middle of the woods, take out the chart, take out your sling psychrometer, boom, you're set. We looked at the specifics of the chart, we demystified the chart, hopefully, and we did three great exercises that we hope helped you learn how to interact and use the chart. There's more resources available on the Rotronic website. Just go to rotronic-usa.com slash academy. You can download the charts there as well. There's technical notes. There is an online humidity calculator there. So if you decide you hate the chart, you can use the calculator. There's application notes and even more. Next webinar, April 27th, same time, and we're going to talk comprehensively about how to make a better measurement of humidity. Hope to see everybody there. Please let us know how we did. There'll be a survey that should pop up when you close out the webinar. Um, let us know how this could be better. Let us know um, if you found it useful and what you thought so we can make the next one even better. That's it. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Michael, for participating today. Thank you, Bruce. We're glad everyone chose to spend time with us to go through this. Hope you did find it was a little bit fun. I know I had fun. So I hope you did too and, and also found it useful in helping you to understand the parameter humidity and how to even take the first step towards better measurement. Thank you, everyone.